Genesis chapter 25, beginning in verse 1. Abraham took another wife, whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Madan, Median, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan was the father of Sheba and Dedan. And the descendants of Dedan were the Asherites, the Letashites, and the Leamites. The sons of Median were Ephah, Ephor, Hanak, Abida, and Ella. All these were the descendants of Keturah. Abraham left everything he owned to Isaac. But while he was still living, he gave gifts to the sons of his concubines and sent them away from his son Isaac to the land of the east. Altogether, Abraham lived 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man and full of years, and he was gathered to his people. His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah near Mamre, in the field of Ephron, son of Zohar, the Hittite the field Abraham had bought from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with his wife Sarah. After Abraham's death, God blessed his son Isaac, who then lived near Ber Lahoi Raoi. This is the account of Abraham's son Ishmael, whom Sarah's maidservant Hagar the Egyptian bore to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael listed in the order of their birth. Nebahoth, the firstborn of Ishmael, Kedar, Abdil, or Ab, Adil, Midsam, Mishma, Duma, Massa, Hada, Tima, Jator, Nafish, and Kedemah. These were the sons of Ishmael, and these are the names of the twelve tribal rulers according to their settlements and camps. Altogether, Ishmael lived. 137 years. He breathed his last and died, and he was gathered to his people. His descendants settled in the area from Havilah to Shur near the border of Egyptian or Egypt as you go towards Asher. And they lived um, in hostility toward all their brothers. This is the account of Abraham's son of son Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethel, the Aramean from Padan Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first, came out, uh, the first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand, grasping Esau's heel, heel so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man staying among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was called Edom. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is a birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread, some lentil stew. 
He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. Let us pray together. Lord God, we acknowledge that we can do nothing apart from you. And we ask, Lord, that you would open the eyes of our hearts to understand even this word. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would come and accomplish all that you have set out to do in our hearts and in our lives. And we pray that you would use your speaker mightily in all these things. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Charles Dickens once wrote a, a story called A Tale of Two Cities, a story where uh, you have two similar cities from two similar countries that have two very different outcomes by the end of the book. There is a radical divide between them. You know, for one city, there is revolution and upheaval and all the kinds of turmoil and pain and suffering that go along with it while the other one lays relatively unaffected by it all. And as Dickens spins his tale, he writes these words right at the very beginning. He says, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the ep epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity, it was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was like the present period. And as you hear Dickens' words, as you basically hear him contrasting and comparing these two Cities. You can also hear in his words echoes to other things and in other places. Dickens alludes to how this particular story he is writing about, these two stories, is writing to his time. It is a story written for his present time that he is living in. He is speaking to something particular that they are going through. He is saying something in his story that deals with the present, that applies to his current setting. But even as he speaks to this present age, I cannot help but hear in those words echoes to the past, to another time, to another book, to another story. You see, beloved, at the heart of Genesis, at the heart of the book of Genesis is a tale of two cities, the city of God and the city of man. It is a story about how man has sinned and broken God's law. How man is now at enmity with God. We are enemies with God. Mankind dwells in the city of man where it is in turmoil and trouble and pain and suffering because of our sin. But it is also a story about how God intervenes. How God reaches into history. How he draws his elect children to himself. How he restores a remnant of humanity. And God promises to restore his children through one particular line, through one particular seed. This is the story that runs throughout the course of the whole book. Even throughout the rest of the scriptures, we will see this. There is a great divide between the city of God and the city of man. Genesis again and again and again repeats the same storyline about two cities and two peoples throughout all of its pages. You will hear it echo throughout all the 50 chapters that are there and into the rest of the Bible all the way through Revelation about these two peoples divided one against the other. It's like a thread that is weaved into a tapestry. Sometimes you can't see the particular thread, but it's always there in the background. Again and again, God shows us the battle raging between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent that's laid out in Genesis chapter 3. And it's often being waged between family members in Genesis, you'll notice. There is a division between the children of the flesh and the children of promise that is laid out again and again. And so as we come to our text this morning, as we come to the end of Abraham's life, 
As we witness God's promise being passed on from Abraham to his son Isaac, and even being uh, witnesses then being passed on to the next children in line, this division remains front and center in the story. And so the first thing we see this morning is a divided people. A divided people. Chapter 25 opens up and it begins by filling us in in some of the gaps of Abraham's life. Here is a, a record of Abraham's life. This is his genealogy as we see him about to be given over to death. Here is uh, a sort of the last words. Well, they are the last words that will be spoken of him in his life right now in Genesis. And as Abraham's life is coming to a close, it's fitting for us to know that his household is in order and that the first thing we learn from all uh, the other possible heirs, or the first thing we learn about is about all the possible heirs to Abraham's uh, inheritance, all the other ones that he has fathered. For after Sarah died, Abraham married a woman named Keturah. Most likely, uh, as you look at this, this is probably one of Abraham's female servants, one who, uh, uh, because of her status as a slave, can never quite replace Sarah. She's not on the same spiritual or intellectual level either, uh, but as a, uh, uh, I'm speaking specifically as the mother of Israel. Now, you'll notice Keturah here in this text, she is called both a wife, like Sarah, but she's also called a concubine in a few short verses. She is a wife because Sarah is dead. She is gone already. And so it's natural to call her name uh, a wife as she is in fact and has been in fact wed to Abraham. But there is, and there is no one besides her. Nevertheless, she is still considered a concubine because of her status as a female slave. You know, she, is in no, she in no way can replace Sarah. But the point of the text here is not really focusing much on Abraham's love life after Sarah, but it is focusing on the fact that he has more children to account for. Keturah has given Abraham six sons, and some of those sons have had other sons. Abraham is now a father and a grandfather according to the flesh, according to the natural World. In one sense, Abraham's name, Great Father, is beginning to mean what God said it would mean. God has kept his promise with Abraham. He has been true to his word, giving him indeed more natural descendants. Though as you come to Romans, even as we looked at this morning, the text is making it plain that these ones are not children of promise. These children are different. They are men who will not share in the spiritual inheritance or physical inheritance of Isaac. And just as back in Genesis 5 again, we see God focus in on one particular line and one particular seed, the one that God has chosen. Notice how here in verse 5, it tells us that Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, though he had other sons to his concubine. Isaac is the sole heir. And that might be uh, uh, troubling for some, at least in the age uh, 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 that we live in. It may seem strange that only one son would receive an inheritance. Why would Abraham not share the inheritance with the rest? I mean, that doesn't sound very fair, right? But remember, Isaac is the son of Abraham's wife, Sarah, who is counted. Uh, I mean, her name even means princess. She is basically the queen of Israel, if you want to say that. If Abraham is called a prince of God among men, then Sarah is a princess. She has a special status as his wife, as queen, if you will. And so there's a status difference between Sarah and Keturah, and just as there is a status difference between Sarah and Hagar. And Isaac has always stood alone as the sole inheritor of God's promises, as the one whom God spoke through Isaac, I will bless the peoples of the world. And so through him, we find the only true heir, the only true child of promise. And so instead of inheriting alongside of Isaac, we see Abraham give gifts to his sons and send them away eastward to the land Abraham came from. 
And the text is vague on the details, but what we're supposed to see is one, Abraham's generosity to his children. Uh, according to the ancient Near Eastern law, Abraham is under no obligation to give these children anything, yet he does so anyway. He gives them gifts sufficient for their, their status and their being. But the other point is that Abraham is by faith resting fully in the promise of God that Isaac will be the sole heir of promise. And that through him, all the nations of the world will be blessed. That he indeed carries the seed of promise. He's not betting hedges, or hedging bets any longer, you'll notice, like he did back with Ishmael. His eyes are on Isaac, looking to him fully as the one that God has set his love upon, that God will bring fulfillment of the promise through. His eyes are on Isaac to walk before God as his father has done so before him. And so he rests on this reality. And all eyes begin to move now from Abraham to Isaac, even as we bury Abraham. And after we learn that all of Abraham's affairs are in order, Abraham dies. After living in Canaan for a hundred years, he died at a good old age, just as God promised him he would in Genesis chapter 15. And he is gathered to his people. He enters his eternal rest and finally receives the promised inheritance. That better country that Hebrews kept, or, or keeps referring to in chapter 11, becoming a citizen of the city whose maker and builder is God. And so Abraham's children bury him. Isaac and Ishmael, they come together and they bury their dead. And he is laid to rest near Sarah in the cave of Machpelah. And we see coming together these two different sons. Again, these idea, these two seeds coming together. They're two very different men on very different paths. And they come together to lay Abraham in the tomb. And then Ishmael's genealogy is given to us. And we learn that he has 12 children that made him into a great nation. That's sort of like the standard for becoming a, 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 a nation was 12 children that would have 12 tribes. Just like Israel herself becomes a nation and it's rooted in 12 tribes or 12 sons. And so we see Ishmael becomes a great nation through these 12 who become rulers and princes, just as God told him he would do. He said he would make Ishmael into a great nation. It has come to pass, but notice, Ishmael receives these few words, and then he dies as well and is gathered to his people. It seems to imply there's a distinction and a difference between Abraham's people and Ishmael's people. And very quickly, Ishmael, the natural son, the son of the flesh who has rejected the promise of God, is passed by. He is laid to rest, and the text narrows in on Isaac again. A movement from Abraham to Isaac, the son of promise. And very quickly, we, see the tr we begin to see then trouble in the womb. Trouble in the womb. It's interesting, but as you move from Abraham to Isaac, Isaac gets very little airtime at the beginning here, especially as a patriarch with the genealogy. The text just sort of mentions Isaac's name and then says, oh, by the way, let me tell you a story about Isaac's son. Let's move on to those who come after him. We already know, in part, in part that's because we already know Isaac is one of God's chosen uh, children, he is one that God has chosen for himself that he would use to bring about redemption for his people. And so in one sense, we're sort of bypassing that struggle that already has played out before us with Ishmael and Isaac between the son who rests in God's promises and the son who does not. The son who loves God and takes him at his word and the one who despises God and his word. That struggle is over and done with. We already know the results. Isaac is the seed of the woman and Ishmael is the seed of the serpent. God has set his love on Isaac, not on Ishmael. Yet as the text moves on, we see again the similar struggle appear in Abraham's children. It's almost like a deja vu or a repeat of what has already gone. Scripture, tell, before, scripture tells us that Rebekah is barren. Lo and behold, you know, Rebecca has had the same exact problem that Sarah had. The same issue is being repeated in her. 
And though this time the text sort of uh, uh, solves the problem right away, uh, saying Isaac, Isaac prayed for Rebekah and she conceived, notice, 20 years have passed in that sentence. Rebecca and Isaac are wed when Isaac is 40. And it's discovered at that point that Rebecca is barren. 20 years pass and go by before she conceives. It tells us Isaac is 60 when his sons are born. There is a major problem here in the womb of Rebecca. Rebecca is clearly following in the steps of Sarah. You see her clearly taking on Sarah's mantle as the mother of Israel, even as she takes on the same problems that Sarah underwent. But the text will not rehash all the trials and all the difficulties and all the troubles related to her barrenness. Only, it only tells us that Isaac, in faith, prayed. And God blessed them with not one son, but two. Problem solved, right? You know, <laughs> Rebecca was barren, and now God has opened her womb. You know. But now, suddenly, the problem intensifies as the children that are within her womb begin to struggle against one another. And the Hebrew uh, here is more like, uh, I know in the English it says they were jostled about, but it's really, they crashed against one another. They are fighting one another within the womb, wrestling one another. They are brawling and at war with one another in the womb. You can imagine how rough this must be for Rebecca. It is so painful and intense that Rebecca, this one who ought to be pleased at finally having conceived, she says, why this I? <laughs> you know, why is this happening to me? You know, what is going on in my womb? Why all these troubles? She is so troubled that she goes to the Lord to hear from him what is happening. And God answers and this is the very center of the text here. He says, two nations are in your wombs, or womb, and two peoples from within you will be divided. And the one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. It's not what we expect to hear. In the ancient Near East, and quite honestly, in most cultures around the world, even today, the oldest son is the one in a position of high importance for the family. It is a significant role to be the eldest son. They are the ones who are expected to take care of the state. They are the ones who are expected to be mighty, to make the name of their father great. But God says here, I didn't choose the one who everyone else considers the mightier, the stronger, or the best. I didn't choose the eldest. I haven't chosen the obvious choice. I haven't chosen the one who the mantle usually goes to. I haven't chosen the strongest. I have decreed that the older will serve the younger. The one who that we all consider the weaker of the two is the one God chooses. And God rarely works the way we expect him to, does he? he? We like it when people can earn favor through merit, when a man can show uh, his worth and his value. But instead, here, God speaks of Esau, and he declares before he even uh, comes out of the womb, you know, this one will not be able to earn any favor with me. The younger has earned my favor. God says, before these two have even done any good or evil, before they can do any works that please me, I will choose the younger, the weaker, the least favored. This is unusual to us. We don't work this way, not normally, but God does. Cain was the oldest son of Adam, but Seth, the younger, was the one who carried on the promised seed. Isaac was chosen over Ishmael. Jacob is being chosen here over Esau. Joseph over the rest of his brother. King David. The youngest of all of his brother is the one whom God used to bless and make a nation mighty. God often uses the weak and foolishness of the world in order to shame the strong. He does not work according to the ways we think he should. In fact, he tends to work against the way we expect. He works in an opposite way. His choosing a people 
is not based on what they can do or can earn before him, but is based solely on his will and his choice. God is full of surprises. And then we see here the scene shift again, and we see now who these boys really are. We learn that there is a struggle that will go on between them. We understand that the younger is the one whom God has indeed uh, ordained to bless. But then we get a glimpse of who these boys are, their character, who they will become when we see the birth of rivals. The birth of rivals. As you come to verse 24, Rebecca gives birth, and the text uh, describes these boys in a, a way that we ought to frame, or a way that ought to frame who they are throughout the rest of their lives. You know, Esau comes out, he, he's red and ruddy with hair all over his body, and he grows to be a mighty hunter in the land. You know, uh, you know Dad couldn't be more proud. The guy's coming out with a full beard or whatever. We hear that, and we think, what a tough guy. This one's a man's man, ready to go hunting, you know, uh, dad wouldn't be prouder. But the way the text is describing Esau, it's not flattering at all. Uh, he's being described here as a hairy child and is supposed to actually uh, draw up images of an animal for us. Esau is the one who has animalistic appetites. He will often act upon impulses just like an animal. He is a man driven by his passions. Again, something uh, that we see layered in him being even called red, his appearance being red, the color of passion. That's why Valentine's Day hearts are always red. There is passion there. You know, the flip side is a man whose face grows red with anger. Passion taken to the extreme, and we see Esau embodies this in his being. He is a man that we see will be driven by his passions and his animalistic instinct. He is a man whom God, um, he is a man whose God is whatever he has a desire for at the moment. Now, his God is his belly. Whatever he craves Whatever he desires at the moment, that is what he sets his eyes upon, and that is all that matters. Notice the text calls him a mighty hunter, and we think that's a great thing. But we, we love this about Esau. But other, the only other place in Scripture that speaks about hunters in Genesis is uh, going back to Nimrod, a man who was the grandson of Ham, a man cursed by God, a man who proved himself to be an enemy of God. Esau is being connected directly to the line of Cain. It's not a flattering image of Esau. And then we see Jacob's character revered here as well. Jacob comes out of the womb and he's grasping hold of Esau's heel. And so his name is Heel Grabber. Basically, and we learn that Jacob is a quiet man who dwells near the tents. And so the image, again, you know, we think of uh, Esau as a man's man. And if that's true, then Jacob must be a mama's boy, right? You know, he likes to do the cooking and the housework and all that kind of thing because he dwells near the tents. Because it tells us that Rebekah loved Jacob and Isaac loved Esau. So, of course, it must be because it's a mama's boy. And a dad is um, a father's son. The text tells us Isaac loved Esau because he brought him food. He loved that he provided food for him. Isaac loves Esau through his stomach, quite literally. He loves him for all the wrong reason. But the text never tells us why Rebekah loves Jacob. No reason is given, you'll notice, other than what we already know from what the text tells us. God told Rebekah that the older would serve the younger. God has promised already that he will work with Jacob. And it seems Rebekah believes in these truths and is picking up on this. And she has hidden them away in her heart. But when we read Jacob dwelling in the tents, it means basically Jacob is a shepherd. He lives near the tents. He doesn't go out into the open field like, uh, um, like Esau, but he dwells and takes care of the flocks and the herds. He is not a mama's boy. He doesn't go off t uh, hunting, but he tends the flocks. And Jacob here is also portrayed as a quiet man. In the Hebrew, that word is tom. And it's difficult to render, but it basically means he's single-minded. 
Okay? It's always, though, in every sense that it's used throughout the Old Testament, it is always used of a man with a strong moral character. It's used of Noah. It's used of Job. Here is a man who has a righteous character about him. A man who is single-minded about something. And his only concern, as it will uh, eventually unfold, is, are the promises of God. And he comes out striving from the womb, striving hard, grasping hold of it, striving for the things of God. He is wrestling with something. He is pursuing something. And it seems to be the promises of God. Jacob is obsessed with one thing and one thing only. And we see that fleshed out here in the story about the stew. Esau comes in from the field and he's hungry and he says to Jacob, give me some of that red stuff, I'm hungry. You know, uh, it's very rough language here. It's very crude the way he uh, presents it. It's, again, like an animal. He's, he says, give me that red red so that I can gulp it down. That's kind of the language. I just need something to get in my, my belly, so, you know, gas for the fuel tank so I can keep going because I am hungry. I don't even care what it is. Just give it to me so that I can gulp it down. I don't need to waste time figuring it out or wait for something else. Esau is driven by his belly, by his passions, by his appetites. He is obsessed with his appetites being met in the here and in the now. And Jacob, on the other hand, is obsessed with the other hand, or with, the, with what comes later. And he says, okay, sell me your birthright. Notice, Jacob single-mindedly pursuing what he is at rivalry with his brother for. He longs for the promises of God. He longs for the birthright to be his. And Esau, very typical of a man driven by his lust, by his thirst for instant gratification, says, what good is a birthright to me? I'm hungry now. And you'll notice, you know, Esau is seeking to fill his appetites up now, his desires now. Who cares about the future? Who cares about the things of God? Saying, what is it to me? What is the promise of eternity when earth is before me? What earthly good is it to be heavenly minded when I am hungry now? And so Jacob says, okay, swear it to me. Make it unrevocable that you will give me your birthright. And he does. And the deal is done. Esau sells his entrance into heaven for a bowl of pottage. And the Bible tells us in this way that Esau despised his birthright. He hated his birthright so much more or so much so that he cared no more for it than a bowl of soup. One writer writes... Esau proves in his action he is not fit for divine election. He has no desire for this thing. He has thrown it all away to feed his appetites in the here and the now. And so our text wraps up. You cannot help but see two peoples here from two cities divided against one another, warring against one another. But what does that mean for us? I mean, it's clear from this text that God has chosen some to bring about his purposes and others who he has not. There are some, as we go out into this world, that, there will, be called, that will be called children of God who receive the promises of God and others who would rather have their bellies filled. And we see some whom God has had mercy upon and others who have, he does not how are we to evaluate these texts? How does it speak to us as we gather together today in Christ's name to worship God? People of God, Romans, interprets this text for us. It tells us how we ought to read this text. It tells us God's 
purpose in the word, his election, his calling to some in his self, and it's not given to all. It is not dependent, though you'll notice from Romans, and Paul emphasizes this again, it's not dependent on us, but it is on God. God chooses some for everlasting not, not, or life, not because of our works, not because we are good or because we have earned it, because we have accomplished something. Office, opt, and it is the opposite. Often we, in fact, are like Esau, driven by our lusts, our appetites, our desire for food and drink and sex and whatever impulse comes to us at the moment. We are content to wallow in them and do what Esau does. Esau, though, you'll notice he gets what he wants. He's not forced into it. He loves what he loves, but God, out of his mere good pleasure, out of his mercy, he has chosen some and drawn them unto himself. He has bought us and pitied us when we were enemies. He has drawn near to us, not because we have earned it, far from it. You know, if we've earned anything, it's God's wrath and displeasure against our sin. Yet what is truly amazing is that he does not leave us to rot in it. There's a story of Charles Spurgeon that I, I love. And as Charles Spurgeon was preparing to preach from Romans 9, this uh, highly uh, 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 contested text, a woman came up to him and she tells him, I've always had a hard time with this text. And Spurgeon, he says, you know, I know, me too. I've always had a hard time with this. And she goes on, she said, I just can't get over it sometimes, that there is something deeply troubling about it to me. He says, I know, me too. It's a troubling text. And she goes on, I can't believe that God could hate Esau and reject him. And Spurgeon says, oh, that's not the part that I struggle with. Never struggled with that as I read this text. What I struggle with is that he loved Jacob. Jacob, who is the lesser, the weaker, the one who is even called at times deceiver. And you see, people of God, we are all sinners. We all are deserving of being cast out. We all deserve God's wrath and his hatred. But what is amazing is that God loves some so much that he gave his son to die for us. Not because we were beautiful, not because we were lovely, not because we were earned it or were the greatest among the nations, but because we were weak and lowly. What greater love is there than this? That one laid down his life for the enemies of God in order that he might have a people for himself, a city made of those who are a remnant that he has bought for a price that he will bring into everlasting and everlasting inheritance. Those who seek after a city whose maker and builder is God. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, We often struggle with your ways because they are not our ways. They do not make sense to us. Father, we ask that you would help us to seek to better know you and understand you in the scripture, that we would be comforted, in fact, by the, uh, by the reality that you love some so much that you have paid the penalty for their sins and brought them into the very presence of God. We pray, Father, that that would not dishearten us, but that we would be comforted by these truths and these realities. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen your people through your sovereign will and through your sovereign uh, uh, care for them, and bringing them to their eternal rest, even as you brought Abraham himself to be gathered in with his people. Father, may we be brought together with the true spiritual children of Abraham, who Romans tells us are the real offspring. Father, we pray that you would continue to build up the body of Christ through, your pre through the precious blood of Christ Jesus. 
We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.